Okay, so on to our first example. This example comes from a health psychology experiment. I think it's a very cool one, and that's obviously a bias for me because I do health psychology research myself. Um, and it's a really cool experiment because it's looking at how we can change people's perception of pain. So in your health psychology lectures at the end of the session, you'll learn about pain and about how pain is a psychological process, which is a little bit of a different way of thinking about it to how you might typically think about pain. Um, but the idea behind this study is that it's looking to see how visual information that we have about our body in space, how that can affect our perception of our own pain. Um, and there's a lot of research that you'll learn a little bit about in the end of semester um, that shows how easily we can actually change people's perception of pain just by changing cues, changing visual cues. Um, and this is one study that does that really well. So it's an experimental study. It's a within subjects manipulation, which we know means that it's the same group of participants who experienced each of the different conditions. So while we're going to have three different groups, three different conditions here, it's the same lot of people whose scores come for each of those different groups. And the research question specifically is looking to see if this proprioceptive information, which is this kind of visual information about how our body is in space, whether that can contribute to our experience of pain. And specifically by manipulating that information, by overstating and unstating how much our body moves in space, can we actually change an individual's pain threshold? The way that they did that, and I'll show you a picture on the next slide to make this a little bit clearer, is by using virtual reality, which is very cool. Um, and the participants specifically were people with chronic neck pain. So we're looking at measuring people's amount of movement in their neck for individuals who experience chronic neck pain. And the key variables here, the independent variable, is our grouping variable, our condition variable. And there's three different conditions that the participants experience. The first one, the accurate visit visual feedback is kind of our control condition, the one where nothing in particular was manipulated. And then the second and third conditions, what the researchers did was manipulate the difference between people's actual movement in space and using virtual reality, they changed what the movement looks like for participants using the virtual reality headset. And the actual outcome variable here, the dependent variable, is measuring individuals' degree of head rotation. So participants were asked to move their head and to stop moving their head when they experienced pain. So they were asked to stop moving at the point of pain and that's kind of representing their pain threshold. That's the citation for the study. Um, and the picture here is showing you what the experiment kind of actually looked like. So the individuals were strapped into a chair and they were asked to move their head from left to right and using an Oculus Rift, which is the virtual reality headset there, what they did was to show participants kind of a virtual reality image of themselves moving their head from left to right. So as they moved their head left, the kind of world shifted left. As they moved right, the world shifted right. But what they did in terms of the manipulation was to try and not sync up the degree of movement in real life versus the degree of movement in the headset. And this is a quote taken from the paper itself. So they're looking at manipulating this what's called rotation gain, which is the, the kind of correspondence between the real rotation and the virtual image rotation. So they can manipulate that, which creates this illusion of either more or less movement than is actually happening. So this is what the data look like. Um, and remember that the outcome variable here is how much movement the participants had, so left to right movement. And the variables themselves are expressed as a difference from the control condition. So remember that there were three different groups here. There's the accurate condition, the understated condition, and the overstated condition. The understated condition was the one where the, move, the virtual reality movement was less than their actual movement. And the overstated condition was where the virtual reality movement was greater or was exaggerated from the actual movement. So the variables there are expressed as a difference from the accurate condition, a difference from this condition. So say this value of 0.85 means that this person moved their head less in the understated condition than the accurate condition. Whereas this value of 1.025 means that they moved their head more in the understated condition than the accurate condition. So both of these variables, the understated and the overstated visual feedback variables, are differences from the accurate condition, the baseline condition or the control condition. 
This is the command that you can use to get the data set yourself. So just like we've used previously, the web use command and then calling up the, sorry, the web use set command and then calling up the data itself using the web use command. So there's two different hypotheses we'll be looking at for this particular experiment for our two different tests. The first one is seeing whether participants have a higher pain-free range of motion in the understated feedback condition compared to the control condition. So if the amount of visual information that the participants are getting reflects less movement than they're actually moving, does that mean that people can move more, they can have a greater pain-free range of motion because the cues that they're getting from the world is less than the actual um, real movement that they're experiencing in their head. So the dependent variable here, it's a single variable we're looking at, and the dependent variable is the understated visual feedback variable. And remember that that's expressed as a difference from the normal accurate condition variable. And the analysis that we're using is a one sample t-test. And specifically what we're doing is comparing the average score on this understated visual feedback variable to one. Because if the average score was equal to one, that would mean there's no difference between this condition and the control condition. Because remember that these scores in the understated condition are represented as a difference from that condition. So we're comparing the average score on the understated visual feedback condition to a reference score of one, to a reference value of one. So remember that before we can actually do any kind of test, we need to understand the, di the distributions of our variables themselves. So we can use the summarize command to look at the distribution or the kind of the numeric summary statistics for this variable. And we can see that we've got 24 observations, 24 people in our study. The average score is 1.06, which is a little bit above one. So it means that just by looking at the means here, people in this condition move their head a little bit more freely than they did in the control condition. And remember that the standard deviation is a measure of variability because obviously not everybody has the exact same score. The mean is just a middle point of that spread of distribution. And we can get a good sense of the actual spread of scores by producing a graph in the form of a histogram, which is what's on the right hand side there. So you can see that there's a whole range of scores that individuals have, but the scores peak around 1.06, which is our mean score, our middle score. And we know that we can formally test the assumption of normality using a particular kind of test called a Shapiro-Wilk test. Um, and this is the output for that just underneath the um, summary table there. This one just over here. Um, and we know that the assumption, um, the assumption of normality is consistent with us having a non-significant p-value here. So this probability here, that's our p-value, and this particular value, if it's less than 0.05, which means that it's a significant result, that means that that assumption is not met. So if we have a significant result here, if the p-value is less than 0.05, that means that our distribution is significantly different from normal. It's not a normal distribution. But what we've got here instead is a non-significant p-value because our p is 0.17, which is bigger than 0.05. And therefore, we can say that our assumption is met, that our distribution is approximately normal, which is great news for our test that we want to run. So the three assumptions for our one sample t-test, meaning the three different things that have to be the case in order for this test to be appropriate. Um, the variable is on, on a numeric scale. That's our outcome variable, the variable that's relevant for this t-test. And here we know it is. The variable is normally distributed and the results of our Shapiro-Wilk test and also the histogram on the previous slide told us that yes, that is the case here. And we also know as a um, function of our sampling methodology that our observations are independent, that all 24 people are 24 separate people. So that's telling us here that the conditions are right for our one sample t-test to be run, which is good. So if we go ahead and do that one sample t-test, remember that we're comparing the average scores on this variable to a test value of one, then this is the results that Stata gives us. We have our descriptive statistics table here, the first row of information there, and then the results of the t-test underneath. So remember that the t-statistic is this thing over the side here, this 3.107. Our p-value is the two-tailed p-value, the one in the middle here, and that p-value, the probability, is equal to 0 0.005 in this instance. And that's telling us that we have a significant result because the p-value is less than 0 0.05, so 0 0.005 is smaller than 0 0.05 
Therefore, we can conclude looking at the mean that people's average rotation was significantly higher in the understated condition compared to the control condition compared to the normal condition. So we could write something like there's a significantly higher pain-free range of motion in the understated visual feedback condition. Um, and we quote our T statistic there with 23 degrees of freedom, which is we just get from the side there, just rounded to two decimal places, and our p-value there. We can also have a measure of effect size, which as I said before, is a really important thing to include in your conclusions by interpreting the actual mean difference here in terms of how different that number is from one. So remember that this variable is measured as a discrepancy from the control condition. So the fact that this is 1.065 means that we could say that the pain-free range of motion was 6.5% higher when visual feedback was understated. And that 6.5 is coming from this 1.065. 0.65 here, 6.5% increase, 6.5% higher. We can also interpret the confidence interval information that we get here. Um, and like we talked about previously, the confidence interval is a really useful piece of information to have because it kind of gives us like a buffer zone around the specific precise effect size itself. So our confidence interval represented by the 95% confidence interval here is the two bounds, the kind of range of um, differences where we're 95% confident that the real effect in the population lies somewhere between those two bounds. Because obviously this is a precise estimate, this is a, a point estimate, a precise difference, a 6.5% difference. But because of the sampling variability that we talked about earlier, the fact that there's a 6.5% difference in this sample doesn't necessarily guarantee that there will be a 6.5% difference in the real population. We think that the size of the effect in the sample is reflecting the size of the effect in the population, but it's very unlikely to be exactly the same precise number. So the confidence interval here is like a buffer zone around the actual mean difference. So 1.02 to 1.10. And that's giving us a piece of information that we think that in the population from which the sample was drawn, the real improvement, the real increase in range of motion that we get in this condition compared to the control is between 2.1% and 10.9%. So I've put that information down the bottom there. And confidence intervals are useful things to report when you're reporting information because it's a slightly more accurate um, approximation of where you think the real effect is going to be in the population. So talking about this percentage increase is one useful way of reporting an effect size. Another useful way of reporting an effect size is talking about Cohen's D, which we've also talked about previously. And Cohen's D is a measure of a standardized effect size because it's expressing the size of the difference in standard deviation units. And therefore, we can, we can directly compare the size of the effect from different measure to different measure, from study to study, because they're all in the same unit of measurement. They're all directly comparable. So using that formula for Cohen's D, where we get the um, size of the actual mean score here, this 1.065, minus our reference value, our test value, which in this case is one, and we divide it by the standard error, oh sorry, the standard deviation, this 1.03, sorry, 0.103, saying the wrong thing all over the place. Let me say that again. We get the mean score, 1.065, we minus our test value, which in this case is one, and we divide it by the standard deviation of the scores, which here, and that gives us a Cohen's D value of 0.63. And remember that that means that there's about 0.6 standard deviation units difference between our average score and the test value. And that's quite a big difference, or it's a medium sized difference, it's a decent sized difference. So we can interpret that as a medium sized effect. So that's our one sample t-test. Um, as I said to you before, hopefully that's made a little bit more sense going over it a second time now to kind of reiterate some of the concepts that we talked about the first time. Let's now move on to hypothesis two, which is our second kind of test we'll be talking about.